was they decided, sort of on a whim, to hold a workshop for drama that was part of this extramural activity. And their turnout and the result and the quality of the productions was so astounding that they decided to make this an annual event of the extramural department. And a number of people came out of these workshops. The students would study at night. They got credit. They paid fees. They got credit. They got from the University of the West Indies. And the first production was so successful, they decided they would hold another workshop in 1966. Um, the people who were associated with this would be Noel Vass and Delmar Solom. Um, tutors were, would have been, in the very first one, the tutors were, um, Noel Vaz was the director, Greta Lyons assisted, Audrey Grinrod also assisted, Roy Johnson, Basil Saunders. They had tutors also assisted by Mickey Kimberk and Dorothy Calmer. They had lectures in makeup and lighting given by Lila Cannon and Prince, a nightclub performer who was the guest lecturer. And I don't know whether that would have been the Silver Prince, the man that I knew was the Silver Prince. I don't know if it was him. Um, students then went on from this to attend workshops in Jamaica and Trinidad. And out of these workshops came the, another group, the university players. So we can, you can see the members of the university players are listed for you. I think that we may have also given you the members of the Bahama Drama Circle. They were up already. Okay, in the 1960s to the 1980s, then spawned a number or a different drama activity. The Nassau Players and the Opsoc producing annual cycles of plays, the Drama Circle and the University Players doing the same. Um, majority rule and independence were creating a new Bahamian sensibility, and so there was a lot of activity in the arts in particular. Um, there were a number of other kinds of things. Different people tried to develop theater spaces. There was this movement towards integration of all this activity. There was also a movement towards creating something that was considered to be um, more authentically over the hill by Rupert Missick Sr., who created the Hay Street Theater and did a performance, but that was short-lived because he didn't, feel, he didn't get the support that the financial and otherwise that he needed. Um, but more and more activity is focused on the Dundas Civic Center. And what I'll do now is I'll round off my end with a history of the Dundas, and then Philip will talk to you about the season. So the Dundas Civic Center was founded, it, was, it began in 1930 um, with Mrs. Dundas then, who created the Nassau Improvement Association. And the main purpose of that was to help to rebuild Nassau after the 1929 hurricane, particularly the areas of over the hill. Um, so there were three purposes, to rebuild areas of over the hill that were devastated by the 1929 hurricane, to provide training for young Bahamians as domestics, and to develop a job registry to accommodate them. So it had a number of different ideas, but it was to help to rebuild areas and to find jobs for people who were otherwise unemployed. And they began in Woodcock Primary and Hospital Lane, and began to train local girls to become domestic workers. Classes started in August 1930. Now, Lady, Mrs. Dundas at that time left the Bahamas for a short while. The work was carried on by the International Order of the Daughters of the Empire and by trustees Ralph Collins, George Murphy, and H.G. Christie. Um, the center was then given the name the Dundas Civic Center in honor of Mrs. Dundas. When she returned to the Bahamas in 1937 as Lady Dundas, wife of the governor, she formed a hotel training fundraising committee because she felt that this now needed its own space. And as a result of that, they were able to purchase a parcel of land on Mackey Street in 1939 for the sum of 3,000 pounds. And this was paid out of the funds that had been raised. They bought this from W.K. Thompson. And in December 1940, the trustees signed a memorandum of association incorporating the Dundas Civic Center as a not-for-profit company. And the objectives, Philip, there are, if you go on, the objectives, oh, go back. Back one more. So these were the objectives, to afford facilities for training in all forms of domestic service, horticulture, handicrafts, and other unnamed vocations, whereby pupils may be fitted to earn their living, to raise the standard of living condition, and that is what they, this is what we got from the book, among the pupils by example and demonstration at the center, and generally to provide civic improvement. 
within the community by lectures, concerts, and exhibitions, and to maintain an employment registry in order to assist pupils of proven efficiency to obtain employment. Um, the Dundas continued these duties up until the 1960s. Um, and then in the 1960s, it also began to be used for other kinds of functions, concerts, performances, wedding receptions, and then Mrs. Davis Cumberbatch's Festival of Arts. Um, as we noted, that she saw the potential of the space for performances put in the stage, and in 1966, perhaps in recognition of the changing times, the classes for domestics ceased. And the purpose of the center then was changed. The dates are fuzzy here, between 1966 and 1975. But in this period, Bob Pringle became, became the chairman. The lighting system would have been installed uh, uh, during the 60s, I imagine. I'm not sure, but it's, it seems that old. Um, <laughs> and the objectives were reformulated. And the objectives then became focused around cultural activity to encourage and assist in the development of all forms of cultural activity in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, to, to, permit the to permit the production and private or public presentation of theatrical plays, etc., and also to house paintings, handicrafts, and so on. And in 1975, the Dundas um, board was changed to reflect this. And what happened at that time was individual directorships was, were replaced by member groups. Um, and the Dundas board was reconstituted to reflect the activity going on in the arts. So the founding member groups of the Dundas were the Nassau Amateur Operatic Society, the Bahama Drama Circle, the Nassau Players, the Festival of Arts and Crafts, the Nassau Civic Ballet, and the University Players. This gives you an idea of the groups which would have been active on the Bahamian scene in 1975. And these were the trustees of the Dundas. The initial executive directors, according to Claire Belgrave, were Michael Stewart, Winston Saunders, and Hubert Farrington. And then in 1975, the chairman became Winston Saunders. He was elected chair of the Dundas. And I hope Andy Gale won't take offense at this, but he was a bit of a bigoty man. And he decided <laughs> that he was going to refurbish the Dundas. And in 1975, he announced that, he, that the Dundas board was going to raise $100,000 for this purpose. And so the campaign, he launched this campaign to raise this $100,000 with a view to making it a functional theater. And a number of phases for its development was outlined, were outlined, and the first phase began in 1975. One of the things that I think we ought, to, we ought to take note here is that donations came from the public. There was no government investment in this. And this was part of the philosophy of Winston Saunders. He did not think that the government should be funding theater because he felt that if as the minute you get government funding theater, then you have government control of theater, and theater should be free to be able to critique. Um, so the donations came from the members of the public, private, and the corporate wor worlds, and you can see some of the initial donors. Um, and the next slide, I think, will show the improvements that were made between 1976 and 1980. Um, on Wednesday, November 10th, 1976, although all these improvements had not yet been completed, the Dundas reopened officially. Um, the improvements by that time would have included the replacing of all the doors and windows to air condition the Dundas, to rake the theater. The back was made into a concrete balcony area, and the front was set up on risers with the idea that you would still be able to do theater in the round or perform on the floor at that time. They were wooden risers that could come down. Theater seating was put on them. Um, you had the creation of a permanent and proper bar and foyer area of the theater. The, re the entrance was relocated from the back, or which would have been the front at that time, but anyway, to the side, which we recognize now as the entrance, and the patio in front of the theater was created. Um, and this included the dressing rooms and the box office also were finished a little later. The building of the workshop and the rehearsal hall in the back were also finished. Um, these, renovati these renovations upgraded the theater, made it into a functioning theater, but they were also a whole lot more expensive than what you had before. Um, for one thing, you had an electric